Okay, we're about ready to get started. Um, picking up on Acts 13 as we continue to journey through the growth of the early Christian church. Uh, in Acts 13, just verses 1 through 3, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Anson, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. We begin to see in the early Christian church that more centers of bureaucracy are being formed. The early Christian church's first central point was what city? It's an easy one. Starts with J. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. As the church began to grow, a, a next major city that became a, a center of Christian activity was Antioch. They were formerly called the Way, then in Antioch they're called Christians. What happens when you get more people? What happens to bureaucracy? The more people you have, what's the relationship of bureaucracy? The more bureaucracy, the more red tape you have. So over the course of time, as the church began to grow, you had four centers of Christianity. One was uh, Jerusalem. Uh, another was Antioch, uh, close enough to Constantinople as well, those two. Alexandria and Egypt and, and Rome. So you had four centers of major Christian control. However, can the church operate with four institutions or does they need, do they need one overruling power? Now we Lutherans might say, no, no overruling power is needed. But in the Roman church, out of the four, they said somebody needs to be king. Which of the four said they should be king? Rome. And that became therefore the Pope. Before the Pope, there were just bishops. There were the bishops of Alexandria, the bishop of Antioch, the bishop of Constantinople, the bishop of Jerusalem, the bishop of Rome, the bishop of, uh, of uh, I, I remember mentioning Alexandria. Why do you think the guy, Pope Leo, 400 AD, why did he argue that Rome should be the top dog? What would you think of why his argument that Rome out of the four should be the top dog? Why do you why do you think people could go with his argument that Rome took precedence? Well, yeah, true. <laughs> but they also knew where Jerusalem was. Yeah, yeah. Has a very economic power. The other thing is, is uh, Latin was now become basically the universal language, and it comes out of Italy. And the other aspect that why Rome became influential was where did they believe uh, Peter and Paul died? Rome. So the argument was he has the relics of the disciples, and we are the bastion of the Latin language. So we need to be in control. Um, they succumbed except for Constantinople. Uh, they did not. They tolerated 600 years. And in 1000 AD, they split and become known as the Orthodox Church. Are you familiar with the Orthodox Church? The Greek Orthodox, the Macedonian Orthodox, the Serbian Orthodox. You've heard of those? Yeah. 
They, they, they just never got into the Pope being the number one dog. And even today in the Orthodox Church, though they, they have the Bishop of Constantinople, they do not give him the same authority that the Roman Church gives the authority to the papacy. So they understand that the papal authority as defined by Rome is probably unbiblical. They do believe in some type of management and some spiritual hierarchy, but not giving the Bishop of Constantinople uh, the same power that Rome has given the Pope. And that's one of the big differences between the Orthodox and the Catholic Church to this day. Um, they just uh, have a disagreement over the office. One other aspect that uh, we find here is, is the calling. Just in these three verses. How do, how, do you, how do they know that they got it right? How do they know that they got it right in verses one through three, that it was to be Barnabas and Saul? How do they know they got it right? And, yeah, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, huh, would you wish you would have that for every call meeting when you call a pastor? Okay. Right? I mean, this is a complicated issue in our church body because of the fact of the way our structure is in Missouri Synod and Lutheran Church versus the Roman Catholic Church and some other churches. Um, in the Roman Catholic Church, they really have to say what priests they're going to receive? No. They are totally appointed. Now, now the Anglicans here with Father David, they've got more of a system like us where they're going to call. But in the Roman Church, uh, the, the archbishop or the bishop comes down to the local parish and he kind of a, a, a assesses the congregation if he goes, what type of guy I have that's going to be really good for this place? And then they just have to take him. So the placement of the priest is all on the hierarchy. But yes, they do consider the, the parish, but the parish has no ability to make the call. Now, in the Anglican Church, they're going to be making a call. That's another difference between <coughs> Anglicans and Catholics. But here, does, there, does, the, does the congregation have a power in the choice of a, choice of a pastor? Yeah. Um, how do you uh, how do you go about it? How do you know that the spirit's working through this system today? How many of you have been in a call process here? It's going to go and must be working. Well, that's kind of like the whole idea about the prophecy, right, Gary? That if what the guy says is true, he's a good prophet. If the guy, whatever the guy prophesies happens to happen, then that was a good prophet. It's one of those things that. Doesn't seem like a very strong argument, but um, yeah, you have the call process in the Missouri Synod Church and Lutheran churches, and and who are so who are all involved in the call process? How does the Holy Spirit work today in bringing you pastors? How do you know this? What's what's the system? Who helps you? Yeah. Right. Right. But the thing is, is where do you get the names? If we didn't have a district, could you get names? It'd be very difficult. One of the things about the Texas district or Indiana district, you know, when I was working certain visitor is I had a vacancy and I call the, I call the Fort Wayne office and I say, give me some names. And, and they have the names. And they also are kind of like in the Roman church, they're like saying, okay, we'll do an assessment of the congregation, see what their needs are. And, and, and we'll match them up with called PIF forms in our office, personal information forms about someone that is going to fit the bill for you. It helps, the district helps narrow it down a lot for us because otherwise we could miss somebody really good. But how many people are eligible for calls in the, in the clergy today, in the Missouri Center Church? How many, how many people are eligible for calls? Some or all of the pastors? All of the pastors are eligible for call. There are 6,300 pastors in, in, in the city. Yeah. Back in the day, I, I, I would say, the congregation knew little of pastors that they would consider. Now we know a whole lot. Yeah, they call it the divine call. 
And I know my father uh, really got frustrated in the ministry because it just didn't seem like divine anymore. It became more political and more who you knew. Um, and that is, that is the truth. I mean, I don't know, did you guys really have an option? What, what option did you have before you called me? What options, what options were left? How many? There's only one left. I was the only one on the list. So your option was either you call me, you don't call anybody. Yeah, you had no choice. You got stuck with me. <laughs> it's supposed to be. But, you know, there were two people that I believe this congregation was calling me and another guy in Michigan. And the guy in Michigan, I don't know, he, he just he just withdrew his name. Um, John White was the congregational chair of the elders. He was calling me at the time and told me that I was on the list. And he asked me if I would do interviews. And I always took advice from this guy by the name of Pastor Telke up in Crown Point, Indiana. He's still alive, just a, got a lot of wisdom. And, and he always would say in this situation, yeah, he would take interviews, but he wouldn't make a visit. Um, and that's what I told John is, I will take a phone call interview, but I'm not gonna make a visit unless you're down to three four, five, or three. Because if, if you're not down to five or three, does the congregation really know what they want? It just seems like a waste of time. So if I'm still in the last three or five, I will come and make a visit. But if you've got seven or eight that you're considering, you, you're, you're, you really need to focus better. And that's what I told them. You've never been that blessed. Yeah. So anyway... I get this phone call from John White because, yeah, he said, yeah, we, we're down to three or four or whatever. So I said, okay, I, I, I carry through. You're down to three. We'll, we'll set it up. But he, he went on to say that uh, you're the only one now. So, okay, well, I'll go down and, and see how we work together in conversation. So uh, Dean and Jill picked me up at the airport. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and I was really, really tired because I was trying to say, I, I don't like to ever take advantage of a church. So I want, I always found the, the cheapest ticket and the cheapest ticket to uh, Dallas at the time was a red eye flight um, at leaving around seven, eight o'clock in the morning. But in order for me to get that flight at eight o'clock, I live two hours outside the airport. You're supposed to be there an hour early. So I'm up and I'm on the road at 3.30 in the morning. And the first thing I do is, yeah, Dean, Dean picks me up and drives me down and he wants to take me to the hotel and says, yeah, that'd be great. I want to take a man. The hotel is not open to take me at the time. So I had to go and see Jill's cat. So. <laughs> no, I did not. We crossed. We crossed paths. Because she was in the airport because she was flying to Seattle and I was flying in. So, yeah. So it was just Dean and me, and, and I, I hope I stayed awake listening to Dean long enough, but I know I was tired. Uh, but we had the meeting in the evening. But it was one of the situations in the call press. Going back to the call process and thoughts, uh, there is no real, what do you call, 100% uh, successful way to do this. Uh, even, even Father David, he's here right now. So... Am I, am, I, am I representing the name like in church right that you guys, the congregation does have authority to make the call for the pastor? Yes. Yes. Um, yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and your diocese or whatever actually generates a call list for the congregation you consider? Now, he just said a key word there that the bishop affirms. This is another distinction between us and Roman Catholicism is that we want to basically say the power of the call lies in the office of the keys. The office of the keys lies with the congregation. But we want our, our, our district president to come in and basically affirm that the church did the right thing. And isn't that kind of the status of that? The bishop says, you guys did the right thing. This is the guy we we're led to believe is actually, he affirms the call. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, so we're much similar in our call process there. Your sports allegiance did come into play 
<laughs> Did it help or hinder? But I was overruled. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I brought in some Viking fans since I've been here. Right, Jill Royce? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the call process went on. You guys called, and then I I had the call, and uh, I took a long time to deliberate because things just weren't right for me to make an announcement. I mean, the church was uh, up at Faith Indiana. I'm thinking, okay, when's the right time to announce the call? And uh, it wasn't just seemingly a right time that I'd received the call. And Jason Nordstrom, as the congregational president this time, was very patient with me, and I really appreciate his patience and his professionalism with me as well about the process, because there were things happening in my life and our family life with Micah getting married and the congregation having a, a wedding shower for, for Micah here at the church, and then the congregation heading out to California to be for the wedding. It's like, do you tell people that are doing this for your family that you're thinking about leaving? <laughs> Not a good time, not a good time. So you guys had to be very patient with, with my process and I was thankful for that, that you didn't give up on it because there were just some things and circumstances that just did not allow me to announce the call. So after the call is announced to the congregation at Faith Iman, what, what, what does that mean? That I announced that I received this call from Christ the King in Waxahachie. What does that mean for the church of faith to do? Just to lay down and take it? They can't protest, but they can come into my office, they can pray, they can tell me that I think your ministry still here needs to continue. I think that, uh, I, I don't think this is, so So you're sitting here as a pastor, and you guys as a congregation, and this is the issue, is which is the voice of the Holy Spirit? Is, is the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking through the call that Christ the King wants to have you? Or is the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking at faith you want that I decline the call? And, and it just is a major burden on one person uh, to, to make that call because you want to believe that when you make it, it was by the Spirit and not by my own selfish interest. Did you the whole process of the fact that you were open to a call, accepting a call, and then accepting a call, and then you call? Yeah, I mean, I, I received four or five calls. I've declined, I declined five. I, this is the first call I ever accepted in my ministry, is this one. Um, I had been called to Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Washington, state of Washington. I've been called to a couple other places, interviewed for a number of other places, but just I just didn't feel like the Spirit was saying it's time. And one of the things that helped me kind of understand that, that, that I was not to move was I didn't like my dad moving when I was in school. And I had two kids. We had two kids. And I just thought, for the sake of stability, I just want to stay here. And things are good. But after, after the both of our boys graduated. I said, well, I'm really, really not open to another uh, challenge, another journey. So the only problem is, is that the older you get, what what is the chance of getting a call? And they, they go down, they go down. The, 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 the idiom at the seminary is this, congregations want a 30 year old pastor with 50 years of experience. <laughs> That works out. <laughs> uh, they, they want the youth, but they also want that, that wisdom, and you, and, and you just really can't have them both. So when I called my congregational district president, my district president of Indiana, I, I, his name was Dan May. He said, Dan, I, I think it's time for me to go. And Dan said, we'd really like you here in Indiana District. Well, can't you stay in Indiana? Or, you know, I said, Dan, I don't think anybody in Indiana is going to call me. And he said, why not? He said, come on, Dan, you know my age. I, I said, I've been a circuit visitor. You, you send me out these PIF forms for these congregations that are vacant. And you know, the first thing you look at is what? Age. I know it's age discrimination, but you can't do, you can't prove that really in the, in the church and you're not going to file lawsuits, but... You know, when you're over when you're over 50, you your your name is, is is pretty much scratched by the congregation up there. And he said, So why why do you think you, you would have better success in the South? I said, I have a better chance that I'll probably be younger than two-thirds of the congregation. <laughs> <laughs> we only make old 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I, and I received a call in Arizona, and I declined that one, and then I received this one. But yeah, I, as soon as I told Dan, put my names in the South, I, my, phone, my phone was ringing again. And that's just the aspect is how that district is helpful. It, it's helpful in keeping churches staffed and, and having pastors find perfect matches and believe that the Holy Spirit is working through that. It's nice to have that, that bureaucracy, to have that system in play so that the congregation can carry out its office of the keys. It is your call to call the pastor. It is not the circuit visitor. It is not the district's uh, responsibility. It is yours. You are gonna to have to make it, and then you have to deal with it. And then after the call was made, and let's say, um, was, I have to share this story. I mean, I, um, information about the call process that was shared with me probably should not have, but anyway, one somebody from the church said that you were called uh, 40, 40 to 4. And you know, the sinful Adam me says what? Who are? <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to tell the pastor that. <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to tell the pastor what the vote is and one way to prevent that is that let's say the vote was 40 to 4 what the current what this congregation should have done is the leader should have said can we now go and and get a unanimous thing so that all the four will then just say yeah 44 to nothing for the call because you know what that allows the district or that allows the circuit visitor to call when they when they call me they said this congregation of christ of the king has what yeah. you know, and do you not think that's going to carry weight with the person Big time. but when you hear 40 to 4 <laughs> <laughs> So in another in another church, the congregation had a vote of 40 people there, and they called the pastor 21 to 19. What do you think the church should have done there? Start over again, because you've got to be closer to that than that, right? Because to call a guy with a 21 to 19 vote. What's that probably going to end up doing in your parish? Creating division and divisiveness. I mean, you have to have some more uniformity as a congregation. Apparently, you don't know what you want yet. Uh, and then, in a way, this circuit visitor, I think he, he did the wrong thing. He, he said, okay, it's 21 to 19. Uh, we're going to go ahead and call this guy. Can I ask for unanimous approval? Do you think he got it? He did not. Nine people stood up and said, well, they absolutely refuse to endorse this call. What should have been the thing to do for the circuit visitor? Start over, start the process over. You've got to have this congregation a little more ready. And for that reason, sometimes people in the church get impatient with the call. It's like, we've been vacant for six months. We should have somebody. It's like, you have to understand it takes time. How long is a healthy vacancy? One year, at least a year. A healthy vacancy, Helps you at least grieve over the pastor that's left. Helps you, therefore, to collect your thoughts and your your wishes and dreams for your church and what type of relationship you want to have with the pastor. So that's very instrumental to think that, understand, you should not fill a vacancy with less than a year's time because there's grieving that needs to take place and there's reconsideration because when the pastor does leave, that allows that quiet voice that never said anything to all of a sudden have voice. And that voice may have something good to say. But because there was not really a good relationship between the previous pastor and that individual, he kept quiet out of respect for the, out of respect for the office. And then when the pastor leaves, now he's more free or she's more free to say, I think maybe we should look at it this way. And that's what the vision committee has been doing. You know, that you'll get that out on April 12th. And uh, look at that, and on the liturgic pillar, 
there are some things there and all those pillars is it's going to direct not just the building committee, but that vision statement will direct your call committee. Uh, and, and so pay attention to everything on those slides. Make sure that you can give a bizarre to those slides. Yeah, bizarre. Um, because we want unanimity, uh, unanimity as much as possible for this, because if we are together, there's no stopping us from the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and one of the things on the liturgical slide is that you're going to call pastors in the future that are more liturgical lean, but open to contemporary service, but also develop Christ-centered relationships in the parish. So that means you're just not going to, you're going to focus on making sure you just don't call a body. And I've seen churches just do that. They just call someone just to make sure they have someone. And that is a recipe for disaster. So there is on that liturgical slide that this church, any call committee that this church will formulate in the future will be determining their call upon whether or not the individual can formulate Christ-centered relationships among the workers in the parish and all of this, and also is an ultra-centered liturgical yet open to contemporary. Um, and it, it, it's just, it's, it's something that's there for the reason to give direction to a call committee. Um, just those are the thoughts and situations I want to talk about the call process in Missouri Senate and the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Donnie, next hand. How long did it take uh, to develop your vision statement? A little over two years. It was, it was, you know, we have friends back there. As soon as we left, they, uh, his name is Ken. He called us. He said, Pastor, the first Sunday that we had without you was like a funeral. How and long have you been there? 31, 32 years. Yeah. Definitely the grieving process. Right. That. So the, the district was wise in encouraging the congregation just to grieve for a while. They weren't even going to stall the call. They weren't even going to start assess the congregation or start a call process. This church just needs to grieve the loss. And then so that they did with that wise. And it took them like they had an interim pastor come in and keep the, sh the, the church afloat. But uh, thinking about actually calling somebody, it, it took a little while before they got there just because of the fact. That's one thing that I, I, you have to treasure about the Methodist church. You know what the Methodist church does? Every seven years. Every seven years they move. Yeah. And, and the congregation. Congregation, yeah, they're more on the Roman Catholic side. Yeah, yeah. Every seven years they move them. What's the advantage of moving them every seven years? They don't get stuck. And they don't build develop a relationship where when they leave that you've got this great hole. And that's the main thing about the seven years is it's in a way there's a benefit to the seven year movement. People don't get stuck on that individual. What's the disadvantage of a seven of a seven year move? Stability. Yeah. Yeah, you know what I was told is you do not see the fruits of your ministry until you've been there for seven years. Yeah. Seven years. And and it's only like parts of the congregation, like the, each pastor. So the congregation never is unanimous. Yeah. That's why they don't let them go, bro. Yeah. <laughs> so any more questions on, on our process and do you see you yeah, Chester? In that seven year thing, the maximum, if I'm not saying that Yeah, seven years the maximum. They can leave earlier. Yeah. But by seven, they feel that if you don't move in seven, you're good, it's gonna be a problem for the church to find a new replacement that helps alleviate the long grieving period so that they can move forward to new leadership quicker. Each other. If uh if a pastor announces that he's leaving in year, 10 years from now, isn't it, in your opinion, is it easier for that pastor to help be involved in the calling of the next pastor? The pastor should never be involved in the calling of the next pastor. No. No. Okay. Because he, he carries way too much weight. Just way too much weight. And uh, On his show? No, on influence. He's going to be very influential on the call committee. You know, if the pastor is staying here when you let's say you call an assistant yes the pastor probably needs to involve that call process because you got to have a working team if you don't have a working team you're looking for a disaster 
But once the pastor has retired or taken a call, yes. Believe me, there were people up in Indiana that said, what do you think? And I says, I can't tell you. You know, that that's up to you guys now. I'm sorry. Um, it, it felt bad that after directing them for 31 years, I had to handcuff myself. But I said, I, I can't help you with this. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts? What do you what do you think? Do you think uh, are you happy with the Missouri Synod or saying how, how the Holy Spirit works? <laughs> uh, is is it any? As far as you're concerned, I think we're probably happy. Okay. <laughs> what what happens? What happens, Janet, if you get a lemon? Well, then they hear from me. <laughs> Make them what? Make lemonade. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you see the early church, did, they had it so much easier, according to the book of Luke. The Holy Spirit said. Yeah, why doesn't anyone have to I think it does get harder. Yeah. If you're praying about something that you really want, I think the Spirit puts in your conscience this is the one, and then you'll vote that way when it comes to and when the when the circuit council or the congregational president calls us calls calls the pastor the candidate, how do you how does he preface it? You know, I don't know if it was done this way, but it's supposed to be done this way. How do you start it? I mean, there's words before has with you has led us to unanimously call you. Who has led us to unanimously call you? That's the way. That's the way the phone call says. The Holy Spirit has led the members of Christ the King to unanimously call you. Do you understand why the words of the Holy Spirit need to be in that statement? That we are saying this, we believe the Holy Spirit's worked through this process. And then the problem is, is all right, has the Holy Spirit worked through the process if the pastor declined your call? Uh, but did the Holy Spirit make a mistake? No. <laughs> This is this is the issue. It it, it it rests a lot. Once the once the call has been issued, basically the total decision now rests only on who? The pastor, the one you call. Yeah. And then you've got to kind of think that through. Perfectly consider the call. Perfectly consider the call. And that's what we respond with me. I'll perfectly consider the call. I and I mentioned it to the church that I'm serving. I have two calls. I'm perfectly considering this call. I'm perfectly consider the call. I'm certainly there at the time. So it's it just hard to, and I don't know, a lot of people think, and I put it this way, it's just like any other job. You really don't know what it's like unless you're in those shoes. And to be honest, when, you, when I was sitting through those five calls, six calls I've had over my ministry, I never took any of them lightly. I never dismissed them like, no. It, it, it's sweating. It is a real sweating ordeal. You you don't want to make sure you get this wrong because that's the last thing you want to do in the church is, is get it wrong. And you have to think of the family. You have to think of moving. You have to think of the needs of the church you're serving, the needs of the church that is calling you. Um, there's so much just rambling in your mind. I don't know about other pastors, but when I had the calls, I had I had problems sleeping. Just wanting to make sure I had the call right. Check what's you out. What did you think? Oh, I said, I said, I said, oh, this is going to be great. There's a target here. Cecilia will like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the the attitude that I, I mean, when I came here, I had to make sure that this church, the culture of this church was in line with the culture of my own. You're not ever going to find a perfect match. You know that. You never find a perfect match necessarily in your marriage. And that's what the call is. It's a marriage. So when you, when you look at your spouse, your future spouse, you want to say, can this work? Because if, if you come into a church and you recognize, that's why I declined the one in Arizona. I, I said, there's just too many differences between you and me. And, and the congregational president said, 
No, you're a man of conviction. You, you're a man I can sense as a leader. You can get us there. And I, I looked at him and I used age as my factor. And I said, look, I'm 55, 56 years old. I don't have the energy for these battles anymore. I have to find a place that I won't have to have a lot of battles to get where I want to be in the church. So when I came here, I said, yeah, this is a good fit for me. They, they, they see the church pretty much the way I see it. And that's what made the call easier for me is it, it, it's, it's a marriage that's going to work. And I would hope that if you've seen them almost in the five years I've been here, that we haven't had clashes, you know, because I believed that your culture and my culture were going to be a good match where we wouldn't have to have fights. This last thing I want to do is going to a church where I'm going to have to have fights. It's not. So you, you, So I look at that, and, and like Tom Basher said, the biggest fight I'd have with trying to support these darn cowboys down here. That's <laughs> I think I can handle that. Yeah. So anyway, that's about, I know that's a long stuff. Yes, you have a question? Uh, Norm. When we are, we as a congregation or whatever, we need to keep in mind that this is something that is involving God and everything. And right. we need to make sure that in our decisions, we are going to the Holy Spirit and asking for guidance. Too often, I think people have a tendency to just want to make up their own mind and do their own thing rather than turning it over to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the in the early Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, they did it that way because Norm, I don't know. I mean, you've been in the church body for years. My dad was, but be, if 40, 50 years ago, you didn't interview a pastor on the phone. You actually pretty much as a congregation made a blind call by the power of the Spirit, which is what Pastor Finke is basically saying here. It, it forces the congregation to really say, are we perfectly listening to the Spirit when we're not doing the interviews and we're not we're not asking them to come and make a visit? That was unheard of 50, 60 years ago. It's changed. Is it changed for the better? Maybe, but but all the interviews and all of the uh, personal visitations and all that, the Pastor Finke's point is true. Does it, is this leading you away from having the Holy Spirit's influence in the call, or is the Holy Spirit working through that? Now, in the seminary now, they've changed that too. I've been surprised. Did I have, did I have, when I got, when I graduated from Cordia St. Louis in 1987, did I have a choice of where I went? I did not. When I graduated from Cordia St. Paul in 1982, did I have a choice of where I went for teaching? I did not. They said, you're going to Davenport. If you don't like it, then you don't have a job. I had an individual, a classmate of mine, that he, he, he determined that I'm only going to take a call if it's within 30 miles of my father. He did not get a call within 30 miles of his father. The, the, he declined the call, and, and you know what happened to him? He was on a blackball list for like 10, 15 years. He finally did get a call up to the area of his father, but you have no choice. But now, congregations, they didn't have a choice. Did Con Faith you might have a choice to decline me? No. They submitted the papers, and, and they, they said, you're going to get who we give you. Today, congregations have the choice to go up and interview these candidates or have these candidates come to them graduates and be interviewed by them before whether or not they, they want to call them. So life, things have changed. <clears throat> and and that, per, that interview process has sometimes worked for the better and sometimes then you, I, I agree with Pastor I think he says, it sometimes may compromise the power of the spirit because uh, I really had to believe that when I got that call to faith, that it was the Holy Spirit that wanted me there. Because the history of the church, I've got the, I got the history, the biopsy on the church at, at Faith and Demont. I was like, wow, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm really green, and they're sending me here. They've had three pastors in over eight years. They went from a liturgical pastor to a church way out non-denominational. Then, a, then they, then they had a lot of controversies of stuff in the church. Of, uh, I'm like, am I really ready for this? 
So I, I said to myself, either the seminary is setting me up to fail or they believe I can handle it. And I had to really say, I, they must have confidence in me that I can go into that fire and, and settle it down. And because uh, I really had no choice to say no, but I knew that I was, I was going into uh, a heavy, turbulent atmosphere. But the, the predecessor, the circuit visitor before me had settled it down pretty nice and it made the transition a lot easier. But uh, we, we have no choice, but now you do. And I think that that's what, <clears throat> you guys would probably all agree that's good to interview the guy, right? I, I don't see why you wouldn't want to do that. But the, the seminary now allows it to happen, but it, it didn't back in our days. They said that's, Basically, the seminary says, we are the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. Um, but yeah, we, I discussed a lot of things on just those three verses because it really speaks about the call process today, how the Holy Spirit works through that call process, how the churches vary on how the Holy Spirit works through that call process, and at least inform you of how we believe the Holy Spirit works through that call process. So if there's no other questions. We will close with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for sending workers into your field. We ask, O oh Lord, that you keep us mindful that the source of sending the workers is Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit. Help us understand that that must be primary in all of our understanding of the call process whenever that opportunity is given to us, that we listen more to the voice of the Spirit than the voice of man. We are thankful for the way you have set this church up to involve the congregation in the call process. We ask that you bless all churches during the vacancies, that they're experiencing vacancies now. You give them the wisdom and the power of the Holy Spirit to lead them to call the right person. And if that right person, if that person is so right, that person will also say yes to the call. We ask that you would continue to send workers into the harvest field by the power of your spirit so that your church may continue to march forward into the world as it proclaims and seeks to proclaim the gospel of Christ. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. I am? This church was in big turmoil, had computers.